Good morning, everyone. It's an absolute joy to be preaching here one more time um, for the last time. And um, uh, really glad to be doing that uh, for 1 Corinthians 16 as well as we close uh, the uh, letter together. Uh, uh, so please keep your Bibles open at 1 Corinthians 16 so you can follow along with me. I don't have slides, unfortunately, um, but uh, it'll be easier to follow along. Um, let me pray. Father, we thank you for the first letter to the Corinthians and the way your word has been shaping us individually as followers of Jesus and collectively as a church. We pray that uh, you'd prepare each of us to hear your word today and to respond humbly in repentance and faith. Amen. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've taken a close look at Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and I think Rod was doing a bit of a summary before I arrived from what I saw. Yeah. Um, Paul wrote this letter as a response uh, to a growing crisis among the, uh, the Christians in Corinth, a crisis uh, of living in rebellion against his leadership and against the gospel that he brought to them. The Corinthians misunderstood what it meant to be followers of Christ. The influence of uh, the Roman uh, and Corinthian culture had on them was too strong. Uh, there, were, uh, there were divisions among them over status. They tolerated grave sexual sin. Uh, they took each other to court and treated the weak among them with contempt. These are problems that Paul addresses in the letter. And the common thread in these issues has been that the Corinthians wanted the benefits of the cross, but not the cross-shaped life. Christ saved us by dying on the cross. He lived the cross-shaped life, and he promised resurrection life in the future. This gospel, when understood correctly, changes you and me individually, and together as a community to live cross-shaped lives and be a cross-shaped community, if you like. Uh, this means letting Christian teaching, values and perspectives overrule the influence of the world and the pull of our sinful desires. We're to live counterculturally, to serve Christ and each other, to build God's church in love. Today, uh, we'll be looking at the final chapter of 1 Corinthians, as I said, and Paul changes his, his tone at the end of this letter and starts talking business. And by business, I mean that he talks about partnership in the gospel. He wants the Corinthians to think we're in this together with Paul, with Timothy, with Apollos, with Stephanus, together with the Christians in Jerusalem and with all the churches of Christ. It's a chapter that has bits and pieces of instruction and it sounds a little uh, scatterbrained, uh, but it makes sense that it's been written this way, I think. Um, Paul is closing the letter, after all. He's wrapping things up. He's not about to start a new argument. And it makes sense why the things he mentions in this chapter are at the very end. It makes no sense to talk about partnership in the gospel if they had the gospel part wrong. So chapters 1 to 15 are essential prerequisite reading to chapter 16. And the big question is, will they take on all that Paul has said to them in the previous chapters? So we'll begin first uh, by looking at the partnership of the Corinthians with the Jerusalem church. From verse 1. Now concerning the collection of for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you are also to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside something to store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. The church in Jerusalem was at risk of suffering in a famine and were also heavily persecuted. So the apostles assigned Paul to stir the Gentile churches across Asia, Macedonia and Achaia, uh, asking them to organise a collection for this particular project of aiding Jerusalem. And it seems Paul is responding to a question they had about it. 
Uh, so he says, you are to do what the Galatians were told to do. It's not as if the Corinthians actually knew what he told uh, the Galatian church because they're in very different places. But he mentions them here because Paul's concerned uh, and he wants, them, he wants to show them that they are one family. This isn't the first time Paul emphasised this. In chapter 4, Paul says that uh, what he taught to the Corinthians is what he taught everywhere in every church. And in chapter 7, 11 and 14, uh, Paul was eager for the practices of the Corinthian church to be consistent with what was done in all the congregations of the Lord's people everywhere. Uh, and later on in this chapter, Paul sends greetings to the Corinthians from churches in Asia. They are one family with the Christians in different regions that the gospel has reached. The Corinthians needed to hear this. Paul was gently but deliberately teaching the Corinthians that the church of God doesn't begin and end with them. He's helping a self-centred church to look beyond serving themselves and to find ways to serve the greater community of God's people. So, like the Galatians had been told to do, they are to make this collection a regular part of their gathering. As they meet each week on a Sunday, that's the first day of the week, as Paul says, they are to put something aside and store it up, as they may prosper. There's a passive sense uh, about that phrase, as he may prosper. We can't prosper ourselves. God prospers us. He's the one who provides for us. And according to what God gives each person, out of that abundance, uh, they are to bring to the collection each Sunday. He goes on to say in verse 3, And when I arrive, uh, I will send those whom you credit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So that they would give cheerfully and readily, Paul assures them that their gifts will be administered properly. They are to choose who they want to carry their combined gift to Jerusalem. And for greater assurance, Paul even offers to lead the team himself. He valued their contribution so much that he would put aside his travel plans to take this gift to Jerusalem himself so that he makes sure it gets to the right place. There are helpful, uh, practical principles here for us um, on how to give, uh, that our giving should be planned, that our concern be not just for our church, but to other churches in need and projects that serve God's mission, uh, that each of us should give according to their ability as God prospers them, and that gifts should be administered properly. But more, more importantly, I think, Paul teaches us principles on why we should give. Paul wasn't concerned just for Jerusalem's needs, even though that's a big part of it. He was concerned for the Corinthians and wanted them to see that by participating in giving, they are responding to God's grace towards them. Same applies to us. When we participate in giving, we are simply responding to God's grace towards us. This humbles us. It helps us not think too highly of ourselves at the end of the financial year when we look at how much we've contributed to the church. As we may prosper, as God prospers us, we give back to God's church and his mission so that it might grow and bring more people under the Lordship of Christ. Now that Paul has responded to their questions about the collection, uh, he goes on to lay out his travel plans. And here we see Paul showing the significance of uh, partnering with him and his team of gospel workers. From verse 5, I will visit after passing through Macedonia... Uh, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter, so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. 
For I do not want you, uh, to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. Paul knows that this letter is no substitute to him being there in person. How much better would it be for Paul to be there with them, not just to express his concerns in, in person, but to model the cross-shaped life? Paul didn't just establish churches and walk out, never be, uh, to be seen or heard from again. All his travel plans here are motivated by gospel ministry. And a priority of Paul's ministry was visiting and spending time with established churches in order to encourage them. We might think that taking the gospel to new ground should be his only priority, but Paul was willing to spend the whole winter there and expresses a delight in the possibility of spending quality, quality time with them. Paul's higher priority, however, was to stay in Ephesus. Uh, this demonstrates that his mission often involved recognising an open door to proclaim the gospel and taking that opportunity, even if there were adversaries. See verse 9. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. By laying out his travel plans, uh, Paul models to the Corinthians what it looks like to be concerned for God's mission in the world. Will they cast their vision beyond themselves? Will they partner with Paul and his team of gospel workers? Even though Paul was not going to Corinth yet, he sends uh, this letter with a team, and among them was Timothy. Verse 10, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you. Paul has special instructions on how to care for Timothy. Uh, not because he's a fragile flower or that his life was in any particular danger or more than the other men that were with him. These verses give the impression that Timothy needed to be at ease from the church. Imagine being the carrier of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. I'd probably hand the letter over and go hide somewhere for a few days and then come back. Uh, surely Timothy will be taking the brunt of any negative reaction that the Corinthians might have towards it. Uh, Paul specifically instructs them, however, that they are to put him at ease. Why? For he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. Timothy was young, but Paul gives him the same authority that he has as a worker of the Lord. So let no one despise him, Paul says. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. The church is to partner with Paul and the team he has sent. He's asking them to take ownership of caring for Timothy uh, by providing food, money, and arranging travel for him to return to Paul with the other brothers. The thing is, uh, the Corinthians had been waiting for someone else. Someone they prefer, someone who they had no problem honouring. And perhaps uh, they had specifically asked Paul uh, why he hasn't yet sent him. And that's Apollos. He says in verse 12, Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. There are limitless reasons why Apollos may have been unable to go, um, but Paul makes sure that the Corinthians know that he has not been hindering Apollos to go to them. In fact, he urged him to visit them. But Paul doesn't dwell on it too long. He moves on to write a sentence loaded with five exhortations. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. 
Let all that you do be done in love. All of this sounds familiar in that uh, they summarise a lot of what Paul has been saying throughout the letter. But the one that stands out a bit odd to me is act like men. I think it stands out because we have in our culture an obscured view of manliness. But what Paul is referring to here is boldness and the courageous nature that God has given men. Paul takes all that he taught in 1 Corinthians, the the humility of the gospel, sexual integrity, uh, marriage and singleness, personal entitlements, how to take communion, spiritual gifts, the resurrection. He translates all this theology into this summary. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. He encourages Christian men, women, boys and girls to be bold and courageous. Because as Christians, we are always in danger of reducing our full commitment to God and allowing ourselves to be captured by this world, by lesser things. The final exhortation, let all that you do be done in love, uh, which is still ringing in our ears from chapter 13. Contrary to how they had been living so far, uh, the Corinthians are to let love be what directs all their dealings with one another. Even the most wonderful acts if not done out of love, they are worthless in God's eyes. Paul has one more group of people who the Corinthians are to partner with. Verse 15. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of uh, Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and labourer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Nicaechus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. Being subject to someone means to be a servant of them. Paul wants the Corinthians to stop being self-serving and to recognise those who labour for the growth, encouragement and edification of God's church. God has gifted the church with people such as these in order to build his church. Uh, God uses these, uh, uh, them as instruments to bring people to know and trust Jesus and he uses them to encourage those who already uh, are saved to persevere until he returns. Paul was encouraged um, by, by those who visited him. We, as a church, must honour, protect, support and serve Christians who devote themselves to the work of the Lord. It is our collective responsibility to partner with churches in need and it is our collective responsibility to partner with those who do the work of the Lord by honouring them, serving them and supporting them as they do their part in God's mission. Among the greetings at the very end of this letter, another line stands out, verse 22. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Every kid at some point dreams of fast tracking uh, their childhood to adulthood. Uh, uh, In a movie called Big, if you've seen it, uh, starring Tom Hanks, a boy named Josh Baskin dreamed of being able to explore the world the way adults do. He wanted to do all the fun things that grown-ups do that kids aren't allowed to do yet. So he makes a wish to be big and supernaturally is then aged to adulthood overnight. But as you can imagine, a child pretending or stuck inside an adult's body is a disaster. No one can fast track their childhood to adulthood. I'm sure you'd agree that even as adults, uh, we are often trying to let go of our childish ways. 
brothers and sisters, none of these gospel partnerships matter if the Corinthians don't let go of their previous ways. If the Corinthians fail to flee sexual immorality and idolatry and continue to allow Roman and Corinthian culture to guide their thinking and behaviour, if they have no love for the Lord Jesus and don't live the cross-shaped life as Christ did and as Paul did, they may as well do none of this. Chapter 16 doesn't matter if they haven't got chapters 1 to 15. Being in Christ's church and not having a love for him makes no sense. Doing Christian things without Christ is just playing pretend. Paul longs for the completion of the work of the Lord. So he says, our Lord, come. Because when Christ returns, all of God's enemies will finally be defeated. And when the resurrection, life begins. He wants the Corinthians to be concerned with this work, to stop being enamoured with the world and be in danger of being accursed. Brothers and sisters, let us love the Lord Jesus and his gospel of grace. And by taking our eyes off advancing our own little worldly kingdoms here, may we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ and to be concerned for the advancement of his everlasting kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you'll keep working through us to advance the gospel so that many more would come to faith. We also pray that Jesus would come soon. But as we wait for his return, help us be men and women, boys and girls, who are bold and courageous, living lives that honour Jesus and those who devote their lives for his mission. We pray in your son's name. Amen.